Hey everybody, it's Jeff again, and we've got a live coding session, as with every week. Um, so, uh, we left off in our last video with a SDL program that opens a window, is able to color the screen white, and draw an image to some location measured in meters here. Now, so this is a pretty significant achievement, but if we want to get to the point where we can actually render physics moving in real time, then we need to sort of break off from this accomplishment and do something very different. Um, today we are going to be working on the basis for a high resolution clock. Um, and what this thing is going to be for is to simply use, now this is, this is awesome that you can even do this, but we want to make a class that when you update it, it measures the frequency of the CPU and how many ticks the CPU, so how many like operational ticks, units of work, did the CPU execute since last time we checked. And between those two pieces of information, it's possible for us to come up with an extremely accurate measurement for how much time went by um, since the last time we checked this. This gives us the tools that we need in order to be able to make basically the core of a game loop. I mean, this is effectively the heart of a game engine. This thing that keeps time and is able to sort of like give our physics stuff um, pretty accurate measurements for how much time went by in the real world so that we can simulate what's going on accurately, right? So this is a, a pretty big advancement, but uh, what I'm going to show you, it's going to be a little bit complicated and you're going to see a few new things. Um, so normally you see this discussed. The first time that it was discussed for me uh, was when I was in my game engine course and I believe for me that was fifth semester. Um, again, really strongly advise that you go to these um, game engine workshops that your upperclassmen are doing Monday and Friday mornings at 9 a.m. Uh, they probably have some pretty excellent stuff to say about like, you know, these sort of basic things that go into engines So, you know, take advantage of that um, But we're gonna get a little bit of a talk about that today. So uh, I'm not gonna ramble on too too long <laughs> Let's keep it to a minimum. So, okay, um I might as well start off by just making this uh, this clock class and see what I can see what I can sort of make of this thing. So I'm just gonna call it clock. I could call it high resolution clock or high res clock or you know any number of things. But uh, okay, so that's that's a good start. Um, I'm gonna do something today that you will not maybe have seen before. Oh no, actually. Matrix 4 does this. You'll notice that there is no CPP file that accompanies Matrix 4. Um, now, this is kind of an interesting thing. You haven't seen that really so far because we've always thought about things as having their CPP file. Um, but Matrix 4 completely ditches the CPP file. And I'm sure you're noticing, sort of as it collapsed all of these functions up, that it seems like every single line starts with inline. What's up with that? Now, it's possible that Scott's mentioned inline to you in the past. Uh, maybe um, inline is something that you often see used sort of for performance reasons. Um, this forces code to sort of be inserted directly into the calling location instead of looking up this memory and RAM first and doing this. This doesn't really seem like it takes a whole lot of time, but over a huge number of function calls it can make a difference. So it's something that we often do for performance reasons. And because this clock is going to be doing stuff um, at a very sort of 
fre- on a very frequent basis or potentially, um, I'm going to try to use this inline keyword um, all throughout this thing in order to improve its performance as well. But um, inline also forces us to write the definition for our methods in in line, like directly in place. So what I'll do is, uh, I guess I'll close this. Yeah, sure, I suppose you can save it. I'm just going to delete it anyway. So I'm going to get rid of this, and I will delete the file because I don't need it for anything. And I now have simply clock.h. Um, now, what we need for clock is not a lot of stuff. We need sdl.h, um, and that's it. Uh, we don't need a ton of things for what it is that we're trying to do here. So um, I'm going to, oh she, this is slightly out of order. Um, okay, so I'm gonna copy in some values that we're gonna have here. So, now I talked about uint32s in the last video. Um, so this is an unsigned integer with a length of 64 bits. You would probably know this more accurately by its um, primitive um, unsigned long. You probably don't use longs very much. Most of the time we don't have need for, um, for types that... Uh, well, I mean, most thir a 32-bit integer, for example, even a signed integer, you can count up to like 2.3 billion without it being a problem. And an unsigned integer, you can go up to like 4.7 or something like that billion. But not often do we need to count higher than that. So very frequently, we don't use longs. Um, but when we're talking about CPU frequencies in the gigahertz and the number of ticks that go by when something is counting up in the like millions to billions per second range, the numbers get big pretty fast. So um, we're using int 64s here um, and believe it or not, it actually would take like a huge fraction of the lifetime of the universe for your CPU to count up and max this number out. So, you know, don't worry about that too much. Um, so, and of course, we have broken this up. We have a couple of measurements that we're making here. So these uint64s, the reason that we hold on to those is because we're counting stuff in microseconds. Um, we're going to keep a value, um, sort of the exact number of microseconds that have gone by since the last frame and since the beginning of the program. We are also going to keep floats that simply hold values in seconds because most of the time that's more convenient because that's the SI unit that we're going to want to use majority of the time. So we'll just compute these float values from these microsecond values that we get. But the fact that we're holding on to microseconds ought to give you a fair idea of how accurate this clock is. Um, so there are going to be a constructor and destructor, like basically just inline here, um, and a destructor. Oops, of course I couldn't spell it right the first time around. Um, I need to also mark you as inline. Um, Oh, my mistake. I don't actually need a uh, destructor. Okay, so we have a constructor here. Um, we have a whole bunch of primitive values here, so we want to make sure, yes, these are sort of, these are like primitives. Don't be careful. Um, so we have these primitive values, and of course we need to um, make sure that they are initialized. So we have our microseconds, seconds, or delta microseconds, delta seconds, elapsed microseconds, elapsed seconds. So we're just going to fill those in with zero. 
Um, so you know how I normally write out 0.0F even though I could just write zero? Well, for longs it's zero capital L. Um, so that's, that's what the zero long literal looks like. Uh, it's not super important that you do that, but just so you know. Um, so now the heart of this thing is going to be a function that I simply call update. Um, inline void updates. So that's how we define our void function um, when we are in... Um, so this is going to be update the clock. Um, after some time passed. Now, so the thing that you ought to notice is that if you remember what our update function looked like in our world, um, in physics, like when we were working on the world class for our like simulation in assignment two, your update looked something like this, right? You had some update that's taking in a float value for the change in time. Well, the clock is where that value comes from. Its update doesn't need that because it's going to directly sample the CPU for the values that it needs to do what it does. And the big hitting lines look like this. We're going to call SDL. Thankfully, SDL has some nice wrappers for this. Um, you can do this without SDL. It's possible to do it by including windows.h and using that directly, but I prefer to use this SDL method because theoretically it's more resilient to um, different, different uh, operating systems on the machine. It probably supports several. Um, so rather than tying myself to windows only, I prefer to use the SDL functions for this. Um, so here we have one value which gets us the current CPU frequency and a second one which gets us the current value of CPU ticks. So the catch is that this value for CPU ticks is the total, like the absolute number of ticks that have happened, not the number of ticks since the last time we checked. So we then need to make use of a value that we're going to hold on to. We need to keep whatever the most recent CPU tick was since last time around. And um, let me see, that should be a uint64. So we're going to hold on to one more value up here. And I'm going to call it CPU tick most recent. Um, and so basically what's going to happen is that at some point in here, we're going to be setting our new CPU ticks value to um, CPU tick most recent. And in fact, um, for, for clarity, I'm even going to rename these to CPU frequency current and CPU ticks current. So we're just basically going to be holding on to this value after we're done doing some math in here. Um, this, what we're doing in here is going to uh, rely upon this pretty heavily. Now, I'm going to copy this in exactly and I'm not going to do anything to change it because, oh, my mistake, I have a couple of differences in my other file and since I changed the names of these things, of course it's going to give me trouble. Um, okay, let's take that off. Great. Okay, so now someone's going to ask why is it super important that these happen in this order? Frankly, I haven't tested it that much with other orders. Um, the guide that I originally pulled this from uh, stated that this operation order was a good idea to prevent loss of accuracy, uh, which I expect has to do with the fact that this number gets multiplied by a million before it's get before it gets divided. I suspect if you divide it first, uh, maybe there is some floating point inaccuracy or the like the accuracy of the floating point type is not enough to store as much detail as you'd like. Uh, this is not a super, super important thing, but I'm going to keep it exactly this way because uh, I have been cautioned that it's better not to. 
um, and sometimes that's a good enough argument. <laughs> um, so basically what we're doing here is the most current value for the number of CPU ticks, we're taking that value and subtracting from it the number of CPU ticks from last frame, right? Because we were just holding on to this value from last time. So what this number is here, we could rewrite that, for example, as uint64 um, delta ticks. So this is the change in the number of ticks that have happened. So we could write it like this so that we're doing finding the change in the number of ticks that have happened on the CPU, multiplying that by 1 million and dividing it by the current CPU frequency. So why does that make sense? Basically this is kind of like having a velocity and having having a period of time and sort of being able to multiply that out to get the distance. Uh, if that comparison sort of makes sense to you, um, like basically we're using frequency. Frequency is the inverse of time, so it's kind of like the time in this equation, and the number of ticks, um, yeah, and the number, the change of, of ticks that have happened is kind of like a velocity, because the higher the number of delta ticks, the more things that happen during this last period of time. So. I mean, maybe that sounds like a little bit hand wavy, but basically the idea is that we can work out the uh, the change in microseconds. So this is this is basically a unit conversion from um, ticks and um, frequency and gigahertz to come up with microseconds. So we're storing the number of microseconds that went by in elapsed micros or pardon me, we're storing the delta for this frame, and then we have elapsed microseconds, which we are simply adding delta microseconds to that. So we're our total elapsed time is just a sum of all of the differences that we have ever computed. And then at that point, you can uh, throw out CPU ticks current, you won't need it for anything anymore because once you have these two values you can pretty much compute anything else you need from those. So we're now storing this CPU tick most recent and then if we want to get values in seconds uh, we can simply do um, sorry let me just grab a comment for this which I had and I'm gonna write in a couple more lines just after here. Uh, forgive my usage of this unscaled. I have a feature implemented in mine that you guys probably don't have yet. Um, ah, okay, and so this is another good case for use of a define statement. So I'm going to put one of these in. This seems like a good... So microseconds, two seconds. I could write a function that does this conversion, I suppose, but... I could also just put in a mathematical constant that I just multiply things by in order to get what I'm trying to get. And there we go. When I have a value, um, oh, my mistake. Actually, I think I need one over. Um, yup, good call. Glad I checked. Um, yeah, so if I have a value in microseconds and I want to take it to seconds, I can do this multiplication, multiply by this value, and it will transform the value into seconds. So all I need to do is take these delta microseconds and elapsed microsecond values, convert them to floats, and multiply them by this constant to transform the value into seconds. Boom, I have floating point seconds and elapsed seconds, and that's all we need. Notice that I'm actually using elapsed microseconds and converting it into a float rather than doing delta seconds um, where I have like elapsed seconds plus equals delta seconds. Um, I don't think it's super important that I do it this way, but I'm convinced that this will probably give me slightly better accuracy. So what does this thing do so far? Well, basically whenever you call update, this thing is going to update the current elapsed time that has gone by and it will give you a value for delta 
microseconds for the most current frame. How is that useful? Well, when we need to create a physics world and that physics world needs update to run, its update takes a floating point delta seconds, delta time. So we'll just pass that in there. We update our clock every frame. Once we've updated it, we can use these values for whatever we need. And in this case, it'll be a physics update. Now, before we get that far, though, I think we should probably test sort of uh, how far things have come here. We don't have anything hooked up to the clock yet, so it might be a good time to back up and look at the main and see if we can, like, actually sort of tie this in somewhere. So um, I'm going to drop a clock into line 29 here, which of course means that I need to include it. Okay, so I've included my clock. No errors there anymore. Um, so where do I need to dive in here? Well, clock is going to start up and it's initialized to zero. All I need to do is call update. That's basically the only thing the clock can do, to be honest. Um, so where do I need that to happen? I think right here is a good spot. I'll talk about why maybe in a moment. Right, so measure current time. Sure. So clock.update is going to happen here. Um, we don't have a physics world, but what we could do is drive something else. We have an image that's on screen right now. Why don't we do something interesting with its position? Um, since we can get the time that is elapsing, um, why don't we drive a sign function? Um, I don't know if I have math. Yeah, I better get... Okay, so I'm going to include this to get um, the sign math function. So I'm including math.h. It's just handy for a bunch of like math functions. Um, so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to zero out its position and I'm going to say 4.0f times sign clock dot um, I probably want the the complete time so not the delta time how much time has passed since the world started so let's have this now so what I'm saying here is um, move between negative 4 on the left and positive 4 on the right using the signal the clock signal for the elapsed time going by to position yourself and let's see what happens ooh that's a chunky frame rate <laughs> my computer is not doing so hot it's probably all obs absorbing my resources but uh, in any case this is what it looks like so you can see it sort of nicely bobbing back and forth from the left to the right and repeating and so that's our sine function doing its work. And there we have motion. We've got at least that far. So, um, next steps. Uh, basically, at this point, we're in a pretty good position to start thinking about incorporating a physics world into, uh, into what we're doing here. And... My bad. Okay. So at this point, um, we probably want to take a look at what we did with those physics classes once upon a time. Because um, I imagine it's been a little bit now, and you're trying to remember um, what what all the things were that... Uh, that you did once upon a time with body and world and those sorts of things. Now, these won't have changed a whole lot, really. They're pretty similar to, to how they were. Um, and in fact, I've made this one even simpler than the one that we had before. 
Um, so the major difference, I think, is going to be that the body that I have created for this um, has uh, vector three properties. Oops, sorry, one sec. I'm just trying to open the project in uh, File Explorer. Okay, so I'm gonna grab a couple files from here. Um, yeah, I might as well bring them over and just review them. Um, so I need world and I need body. So I'm gonna copy both of these. And, um, oh, actually one more thing. I am going to grab this planet.ping. We're gonna want that too. So um, let me just move this into a three demo. I'll drop these files in. And I want to make sure that body and world both get included in my project. So I'm gonna drag them in. Uh, I probably want my CPP files to not be in the headers folder. Okay. So, I'm going to close up a few things, because we've got a lot of stuff open right now. And um, I don't even think I'm going to need to look at clock for a little bit. So, let's, let's do a quick review of what we had built for Assignment 2. Um, now, this is slightly simplified, but... Um, you can take a look at a body, and this should be pretty familiar, is that we have a floating point mass, we have a vector 3 for acceleration, one for position, one for velocity. I had a constructor where um, it takes a mass, which defaults to 1.0 kilograms if nothing's entered, and it takes a position, which defaults to vector 3.0 if nothing's entered, as one function to apply force to the center and it takes in a force vector which we use to modify the acceleration, right? So this is what our body looked like um, probably basically since assignment one. Um, so world I have simplified slightly. World used to have a couple of vectors that it took in um, for gravitational um, gravitational acceleration and I believe wind force. So I made those uh, to make a point in assignment two about how um, about how different um, axes of motion do not affect one another. But this time around um, we're going to think about our simulation as though we're looking down at the world like top down and we're just going to watch simulations sort of play out in two dimensions between the objects there. Um, gravity isn't downward. Gravity is going to be wherever we say gravity is. We are going to tell the objects in our world to exert gravity upon one another. Uh, we're going to do something a little bit more interesting than just saying what down is. Uh, and there's no wind in space, so we're not going to have wind either. So it makes our constructor and destructor very simple. Um, we simply have add body, remove body, and update pretty much just like before. Um, you'll notice that I did a couple of things in here um, where I made uh, bodies and elapsed time on the world private and simply made these things uh, available here. Um, I bet somebody is asking the question, but we have a clock. Why is there an elapsed time here? Um, and frankly, that would be a pretty great question. So thanks, alternate me, for having that thought. Um, why we need this value for elapsed time is because this reflects the time that the physics engine has simulated up to. While we are basically keeping this up to date, um, Especially if we build our world to be a little bit more robust, um, we're going to find that this physics world is often just a little bit behind real time. This is not super essential for what we're doing here, but we're going to build on this eventually. I want to show you something about how physics worlds can produce a fixed time step, which sounds like it shouldn't make sense because you're always getting a different delta time, but it's possible. Um, and it's a very good upgrade to a physics world. And we'll talk about that in the future, 
but that's kind of why this is here. Now, if you remember, um, of course, when this starts, you need to set the elapsed time to zero, so that's what our constructor is doing. When the world is deleted, we get rid of the bodies and clear it. You remember this crazy business about adding and removing bodies. And then last but not least, certainly not least, is the world's update. Now, for our world here, I'm going through all of the bodies, updating their velocities with their acceleration values, updating all of their positions with their velocity values, of course multiplied by delta time that's being passed in, and then clearing all their acceleration values. Um, and then I simply update the elapsed time timer when I'm done. This is pretty much really simple. Um, more or less what you would expect from a world. So these are fairly simple classes in themselves. Um, so again, probably the only big difference that we can note is this vector 3 here. And frankly, this vector 3 is a lot nicer to use. Um, so, uh, now I think the bigger question then is how do we get the world into everything that's going on here? Uh, there's a lot of stuff going on. Um, so we might need to do a little bit of work uh, to get ourselves uh, a physics world integrated into what's going on. Now I'm just going to simply include world um, and I'm going to add a world object to the top level here which should be reminiscent of the kind of thing that you did for assignment 2. So I'm going to drop my world in here and um, we're going to figure out what to do with this. Now, um, yeah, let's start from that update. That's the last thing that we had talked about, this clock update. So this high-resolution clock is being updated, and immediately after it's updated, we have access to the information about how much time passed. Now, usually in a game loop, the way that this works is that the clock ticks and then... There's, there's sort of two ways this can go, where, um, or pardon me, I'm sort of talking about something a little bit different. Um, usually you'll have some sort of gameplay code that runs in the middle here, and well, I'm going to throw a to-do in there, because I have an idea. We're going we're gonna to do something cool, but maybe in a future lesson. Um, and here we're going to update the physics world so that's going to be our next order of the day because that's available to the clock and we can just say world update clock dot oops not delta microseconds um, delta seconds great thanks okay so now our world is doing one update step with the delta seconds that is coming in from our clock. All right, cool. Um, but what do we do with that? Well, I guess to get to sort of where we were before, we need some bodies. Like we need something to simulate some some positions here. Um, so that's going to be um, number two. So I'm going to create a couple of body pointers here. Um, you can try using bodies without the pointers. I encountered some weirdness with um, the types giving me grief, and um, I had some issues when trying to use or not use new. To be honest, I can't remember all of the details because it's been a couple of weeks since I wrote this. But um, you may just find that using body pointers for this is just simpler. So you know, it's my advice for now that you just do this because you'll just run into less problems. Um, so I'm going to create a couple of bodies. Uh, that seems like a pretty good place to start. Um, now, I know the naming isn't exactly perfect for it, but I might as well do it inside this load assets function. Um, so, Sorry, if you can hear that over my microphone, there is somebody upstairs probably moving furniture. Um, <laughs> so, anyway, uh, I'm going to use the bodies constructor, or pardon me, I meant to say new body. And 
let's just make one with a mass of one. I know that's the default, but you know, let's do that. And uh, where do I want to position this? Actually, I'm just going to position it default as well. Um, and again, I know 0, 0, 0 is the default, but I just like to write everything in explicitly because that's just how I roll. Um, and, well, if we want to see motion, why don't we do that? Um, I'm just going to throw in a velocity here, so I have a velocity of 1 on the x-axis. That's what that will give us. Um, and lastly, uh, I think everybody's pretty familiar with this line of code is a uh, world, oh actually, my bad, world uh, dot add body. So you may see that I'm sort of working up to having some sort of planet and star. If you've read anything about assignment three, uh, this should probably feel like a good thing that I'm being nice enough to show you that much. So what we're going to do is we're just going to make this planet body to start with. Of course, I have this star body available here as well, and we're going to talk about that too. Um, but let's just start with one. Let's just keep things pretty simple. Um, now, we're also going to have something for this. Um, now, this is why I brought this planet.ping along. Um, so now you can see this sort of group, all of this stuff together, is like, so we've got load the planet, um, basically avatar image, um, create a physics body for it, and add it to the world. Note, give it a little push first. All right. So, okay, we have this thing. Now, basically, the last thing that we would need to do is be, oh, actually, all right. So we only have this one texture here. Oh, that's fine for now. That'll work. Um, lastly, I'm going to need to use this body's position to figure out where to draw, right? So, um, previously I had this little chunk of code here that was just taking some random physics position that I came up with and turning it into a position to render at. Well, why don't we do something more useful than this and use that body, um, to get us a number. So, I'm gonna... Yeah, actually, you know what? I'm just going to use this. This physics position, we're just going to call it... We're going to do something else with it. Um, so we want... <laughs> yeah, actually, reading over my own code, I notice that physics position is actually just exactly this. Um, so in fact, uh, things get even easier than that. Physics position goes away because we are now using planet body position. There isn't an easier way to indicate that this is in fact a physics position. But um, now, while this is really cool, and let's see what this does, I'm curious if this is going to work. Okay, it didn't like that this time, but we'll figure that out. Um, actually, let's see what this is with no velocity. That's, that's my first thing. Okay, well, at least it appears somewhere. But you'll notice that it was at zero, zero, zero. Like it should be exactly in the center of the screen. And it is because this is an image from the top left corner. So we need to make a tiny adjustment. Um, so what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna break this out to a couple lines because I think it makes it look like a lot more um, sort of manageable. Um, and now, 
I want to be able to use a small adjustment here. Now, so this is from the way that my own is written. And that should work here. Uh, oh yes, I don't have planet texture yet. So texture.width and y is texture.height. What did I do here with this 0.5 and 0.5? So what's happening is that, there we go. What's happening is that the image is rendering from its top left corner um, going counting positively on the x-axis to the right and positively on the y-axis to the bottom. So if we want this to render in the center, we need to subtract half of its width on the x-axis to move it back into centered on the x-axis and we also subtract half of its height on the y-axis and that centers it on the y-axis and our coin should be dead center now. Boom. Now, in a future episode of this, we're going to look over how we can do this in like a much more like object oriented, like nicely encapsulated kind of way. Because I want to introduce you to sort of like coding standards to some extent. And I really want everybody to understand that your code isn't done when it works. Um, we're we're going to build up to that. Like good programmers make good bloody code and not just for what it's supposed to do but for the other programmers too so we're gonna I'm, I'm gonna hit that eventually um okay so we have this thing drawing dead center but um motion was an issue so maybe i just moved it too fast let's let's try a small number let's try 0 0.2 for for velocity let's see what that gets us That also seems like it was a very fast object. What if I make it an incredibly small number? Still doesn't like it. Doesn't like any of it. Okay, so it's always interesting to have a problem to debug on the fly. So what's up? Why do I have a problem? Um, actually, let's, uh, let's take a tiny step backwards. I added that clock, but I never really tested it. Um, I didn't have a way, good way set up to do that at the time, but um, okay. The reason that I bring up debugging the clock is because I'm not entirely certain that it's not just counting very, very big numbers. Um, maybe our stuff is leaping out to infinity because there's something wrong with how the clock works. So why don't we just use the console to print out um, where our clock's at through time and um, we'll just watch. So we can, oh, well, that's a big number. That feels like it could have something to do with the problem because if that's supposed to be in seconds, I think we got something wrong. Um, okay, so. Let's take a good look at our clock. Um, aha, I see the culprit. It is possible that not setting this to zero uh, caused us some issues. Probably what happened is the first tick because this was garbage data, this delta ticks from the first tick that ever happened counted some completely enormous number and our elapsed microseconds got added to with a humongous delta microseconds. That's my bet. Let's see if that made any difference. Well, our velocity is now like two thousandth of a meter per second or something like that so I'm not really expecting it to move very far uh, so let's let's go back and revise this thing's velocity now that oh no it was in fact set to zero okay let's try that positive one meters per second this time and see what that gives us huh okay so we're still sort of in the same problem 
Interesting, interesting. All right, so what have I done to the clock? This is going to be an interesting investigation. It is possible that when I did this, I broke something. Let me see if that changes anything. Nope. Okay, so that's not likely. That seems like it's probably working just fine. Hmm. This is a very interesting problem to have. Maybe it is something in my main. I was suspecting my clock, but maybe there's some other problem that's happening here. Is there something wrong with the or pardon me what am I saying my clock is reporting a completely insane elapsed time elapsed microseconds okay let's test a couple of other things let's get a bunch of different values I'm uh, curious to see what's all in here so I'm going to Can I just do like tab? No, of course I can't. Okay, so I'm just gonna throw a tab character in here, and here, and here. So what I'm gonna show is elapsed seconds, delta seconds, um, delta microseconds, and elapsed microseconds. Alright, so let's see what these all print out as. Okay, so our elapsed times are giving us weird numbers, but our delta times are probably giving us pretty accurate numbers. What you're seeing here is that elapsed microseconds, so this is sort of like a most accurate reading for our elapsed time, is reading 16,000 microseconds, which is 16 milliseconds, which is basically 60 frames per second uh, and that is what we would predict given that we are running SDL with um, VSync turned on. So that sounds about right. That seems great. But you also notice that it is multiplying an absolutely fantabulously large number um, on for whatever our first computation is. But it is also affecting microseconds. So it's not just that our microseconds to seconds conversion is broken, that looks fine. There seems to be some sort of problem with the way that the elapsed microseconds are being computed in the first place. Um, so I still have a certain a certain guess that it has to do with this basically this line of code. Um, it's a, it's an interesting line of code that, that has a problem here. So elapsed microseconds is being set to zero. So, okay, I'm curious. If I have a problem with this line of code, why don't we see what actually is breaking down here? So I'm going to set a breakpoint. Um, I haven't shown you this before, so... Now this video is probably going to go a little bit longer than I would like, and I'm not going to get as far along with it as I kind of hoped. I don't think that we're going to get a world rendering nicely by the time that this video ends, because I'd rather at this point like to show off some ways that you can debug. So I can put down breakpoints over here and run my code in debug mode, and my code will stop right at that point. So okay. Aha! Okay, alright, I understand. So my CPU tick most recent, which I was like, oh, I'm smartly going to make sure that this is set to zero, because obviously this is a primitive, I should make sure that it's set to zero. I made a very critical mistake. So the CPU tick most recent has to act like the tick last frame. 
if it acts like the beginning of time, then the time that gets added for the first delta is since the beginning of the clock can measure, which I'm not even sure what that would mean. It's a very, very far back in time. Um, so, um, now notice that breakpointing made this immediately visible to me. Like, I was able to hover over the values in here, so I was able to spot that this value was in fact the problem, and it was one of the variables that I was concerned with. So I had my eye on it, because it seemed like looking at this computation and the prints that were coming out from here, that there was something wrong with how elapsed microseconds was being computed. And sure enough, this value is one of the things that leads to that, that number. So by breakpointing, this lights up. It's so helpful to understand what's going on. And furthermore, for those of you who um, would like to be like more proficient with this, it's possible to do things like stepping over and stepping into functions. Now, because this is a primitive addition, there is no stepping into to happen there. But basically what happened is I just told the computer, okay, move to the next line of code. So compute delta ticks for me, great. So I have that number now, and then I'm going to compute delta microseconds, so I'll tick one more time, and wow, it even drops down into the, uh, into the assembly. This is the compiled assembly for this program, I'll have you know, um, so that's, that's pretty awesome. I'm not going to do that, but um, step out. Yeah, so step out will get you out of being super deep into somewhere and sort of let things move on. Um, right. So, cool. Um, I'm just going to run that one more time and I'm going to do step over, step over. So anyway, I mean, this just lets you see, and that's that 1.670 that I was seeing, very big number. Um, but, uh, yep, that's it right there. So I want to make like totally clear that breakpointing is amazing for debugging. Probably right now you hate compiler errors and debugging is your worst nightmare. If you learn some basic skills about how to use your debugger, your breakpointing features and those things like that, you will gain a massive edge in what you can do with programming. You will feel like you are a great deal more in control of seeking errors and just simply clamping down on them like there will be so much less fumbling around in the dark i promise so let's apply this fix that came to mind so what do i need to do this shouldn't be zero what i need it to be is the value of sdl get performance counter because that will get me the time at which i initialize this thing it will get me the cpu tick the moment the constructor runs. So that should be immediately at the very, very beginning of the program. Now, there's sort of two possibilities for how we could go about we could go about doing this. Um, actually, probably the most accurate thing that we can do right now is just make sure that we call update and then this will sort of tell us these will automatically update sort of in response to that. Um, so it's probably good to do both of these things. If this time is not zero, these values don't really imply that they're zero. So we should probably uh, probably make sure to update that. Um, another way that we could approach this, and perhaps even a better way, in fact, is to do something along these lines. If um, CPU tick most recent um, is equal to zero, then um, do a get performance counter for this on the spot. And in fact, um, I should probably do these things, and then that way we, like our first update, will sort of report zero.
and um, we'll just hold on to that right there. So basically what that's going to do is it'll just mean that the first time that you run update will basically be the beginning of time. Um, and we can approach this, in fact, even a different way, yet again. Um, okay, let me, let me try one more different idea here. I always like fixing bugs and trying to, trying to do something a little bit different. Let's make a function. We're going to call it start. And so basically this is going to be what causes the what causes this thing to like begin counting time. The problem with putting this in the constructor is it means that the instant that this class is that the clock gets constructed, time has begun. There's no option to delay starting the game clock until some things load, for example. It will immediately clock the time at the very, very beginning of the application. But if I leave this start value here, um, then I can call this before update, and um, that, will, uh, that will get that to happen. So let, let, let me try this out. So if I include it in my start, um, let's start. In fact, I could even put it at the end of my load assets. So I'll load all my assets and build all those things first, and then I'll start talking about updating the clock. Um, so clock.start, and that's it. And so we're just updating the clock each tick here, and we're passing delta seconds into world.update. Um, so I guess we'll run this and we'll see if there's been any change to the time. Okay, so I still had that breakpoint, so I'm just going to turn that off and let this continue. And our timer is ticking up nicely in even seconds. I love it. So I'm just going to get rid of this print statement because I don't really very well need it anymore. I've got my world update sort of clicking along, and um, so if I actually look at the thing that is running, sure enough, my velocity is now being applied, and I actually have some nice, clean motion. So um, I'm just looking at this right, and so that's with a, a velocity of 1.0 meters per second uh, to the right. Now, I mean, I guess I'm coming up on basically exactly an hour at this point, and maybe it would be pushing it to, uh, to go much further than I have already. Um, so let me check over where I'm at. And yeah, there's a little bit of complex math upcoming. So why don't we stop right here? I think this is a pretty good spot. See you later.